So I'm Marnita Harris. With the, I'm the Director of Engagement with the Detroit Regional Chamber. I would like to thank you all for joining this session. The Chamber lost this, launched this series to help our businesses uh, restart um, operations and return to work. And I would like to thank our guest speakers from Miller Canfield for taking the time out of their day to share this information with us. Before we get started, I want to share that all participants are on mute now. They wasn't before, but you are now. <laughs> and uh, you have an option to submit questions directly to speakers through uh, the control panel. So there's a uh, chat question right there where you can answer, ask questions and the panel will see it and can answer. At this uh, moment, hi Ryan, I see you are almost popping up there. Um, uh, I will turn the rubber now over to Rick. Uh, Rick Wallerani is the senior principal at Miller Canfield. So over to you, Rick, thank you. Okay, thanks Marnita and welcome everybody. Uh, as Marnita said, I, uh, I'm gonna moderate a uh, team of our lawyers to talk about what to expect and what uh, what we know and what we don't know so far about the PPP loan audit process. Um, <clears throat> let me just quickly uh, introduce my colleagues here. Um, Jeff Labine, uh, <clears throat> he's uh, also a co-leader with me of our corporate group, and he's been advising clients on compliance matters relating to PPP loans and loan forgiveness, and also as part of the audit process. Uh, Ryan Real uh, is a, a partner in our tax practice and an expert in the whole tax implications of PPP loans. And then <clears throat> finally, uh, also joining us is Jerry Gleason. Jerry is a you know, litigator in, in our Troy office, um, and he focuses on uh, really criminal defense and and uh, defending clients against uh, uh, you know both civil and criminal uh, <clears throat> claims. And you might wonder why we have a criminal lawyer on this panel, and you'll find out <laughs> uh, when Jerry talks. So let me just give a a, a, a quick overview. Um, as to what to expect in an audit, potential audit. So as you know, the PPP loan established through the CARES Act, uh, you know, and, and subsequently uh, expounded on in, in uh, final rules, interim final rules promulgated by the SBA and Department of Treasury, uh, provided loans and loan forgiveness opportunities uh, based on you know, borrower certifications and documentation really provided uh, and and made by the borrower and documentation provided by the borrower. Um, the SBA announced uh, early on that it will be auditing loans and, and it uh, actually announced that it will audit every loan over $2 million. Uh, and, but that doesn't mean necessarily that loans under 2 million are not subject to audit. and and Jeff will talk a little more about that. So if the SBA decides to audit a loan or when it decides to audit a loan, the procedure is it would notify the lender in writing and then the lender then has uh, five business days to uh, notify the, the borrower that it's subject to the audit. And the uh, just as an aside, the, the statute of limitations here is similar to the tax one, so you got you got to keep documentation relating to this uh, for six years after the date the loan is forgiven or repaid in full, and um, and you as part of certifying to get a loan, you have authorized uh, representatives of the SBA, including uh, the Office of Inspector General, to access files uh, upon request uh, uh, documenting your various uh, aspects of, uh, of the loan. So quickly, what, what is the SBA going to audit? And there's really four, four areas that are subject to audit as, as announced by the SBA in the interim final rule they issued on the topic. One is eligibility. Um, 
So the SBA will be able to consider and will be considering whether a particular borrower was eligible to, uh, to for a PPP loan under the, the CARES Act, under SBA rules, uh, available at the time of the borrower's application. And uh, one of those eligibility requirements was uh, the certification by the buyer that it needed the loan. Um, and that it was making that 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 uh, certification of necessity in good faith. Again, Jeff will talk more about that. Another another area subject to audit is the loan amount. Whether you whether a borrower calculated the loan amount correctly that it was eligible for. And then <clears throat> third area is the use of proceeds. So. Um, Proceeds that were were restricted to certain expenses that were allowable uses and eligible expenses, and this is restricted regardless of whether the amount is subject to forgiveness or not. There were certain restrictions on what you could use the money for, and then finally, um, the fourth area is the loan forgiveness calculation, and whether that was done in accordance with the rules and um, uh, that were promulgated by the SBA. So let's uh, dive into these things. Uh, first, uh, we'll ask Jeff Labine to maybe start off by setting the stage for the issue. Um, so Jeff, the latest figures I've seen are about that only about 20% of all, all PPP loans were under 2 million, were for 2 million or more. And some in the press have already reported that loans uh, under two million are not subject to audit. Uh, is that true? In short, no. Uh, there we go. Done. Um, what it ends up being? So, Secretary Mnuchin, Treasurer, is on clearly saying that they will do an audit of every loan under two million. The SBA, which is where you're getting a bunch of these press reports, is that, you know, we'll review all loans in over two million, but they put in the little caveat, of course, in addition to other loans is appropriate. So while there's getting a lot of press and there's a lot of paperwork written that you have this ability, if you're under two million, don't worry about it. It's only over two million, or as everyone's seen, Shake Shack and a number of other public company issues. If you're under two million, you're fine. Don't worry about anything. And it's just, it's just not true. You may have to worry a little less, but the concept that it's, you know, to use the what was the children's game, Ali Ali and free. If you're under two million dollars, it's just simply not the case under the current guidance. And it certainly is not proving to be the case based on a number of the recent enforcement actions over the last couple of months and statements out of the attorney general's office. Okay, so what is what is the two million dollar safe harbor that that we hear so much about? Explain that and what what kind of safe harbor that provides. Yeah, it's I would submit, and we have our Jerry, my partner Jerry Gleason, will get later into. Most people think of a safe harbor as if I follow this rule or I did this thing or didn't do that thing that I'm kind of immune from prosecution. And what the safe harbor is here is a number of statements by the SBA and others have said that with regard to the certification of need, and we're gonna hear that coming up a few times here today, and we're gonna go into it in detail in a few moments. But right now, every borrower that entered into a loan had to certify they needed the funds. Again, we'll get into a little more detail. The challenge with that became, there's a number of statements, including an FAQ answer as part of an IFR dealing with this, that basically said that for loans under $2 million as an administrative convenience, they would view loans under $2 million as the borrower having made that certification in good faith. And that started getting referred to as a good, as a safe harbor. However, just even as the way I phrased it, you saw there's a bit of a caveat there. It says, one, the agency has an administrative convenience and has a rule, so that's the SBA. It is not binding on the SBA or anyone else. It does not exist in the CARES Act. Um, and as we touched upon some of the recent enforcement action, uh, I believe last week, 
was a loan for $33,000. Someone woke up in the morning and Treasury was at their front door. So the $2 million helps significantly as a threshold if your loan was under two with not getting as deep of a potential concern on your certification of need, but that's all it does. It is not a safe harbor in the traditional sense. Um, Essentially, it basically says, if it's the SBA that comes knocking or if they come knocking for other reasons, they have at least said they don't plan on contesting your certification of need. That's all all it is. Okay, maybe maybe talk, uh, since this is a, a probably the issue getting uh, the most attention, maybe talk a little more about that that necessity certification, um, what that is, how you do it, what it means, and why it's so important. Okay, so as far as why you do it, we'll have the kind of the snippy answers because you have to, but the actual answer is if you looked at every borrower that took out a PPP application had a sentence that they were required to certify, that current economic uncertainty makes the loan request necessary to support ongoing operations. Now, that basic language, which comes pretty much from the CARES Act, mostly, led to a bunch of questions, concerns. When you start thinking of it's necessary for my ongoing operations, initially that left borrowers, lawyers, accountants, kind of going, okay, does that mean if I don't take this money, I'm gonna go bankrupt? Is, is that the test? Because if you think about it, it wouldn't have actually see, served the underlying need by the SBA and uh, Congress put out, which was to help borrowers, businesses stay afloat, pay their staff, notwithstanding that maybe that staff couldn't work at all or had to work less. Now, they came out, SBA came out with a little guidance pretty soon thereafter that basically said in making that certification, you have to make it in good faith, You have to take into account your current business operations, ability to access other sources of liquidity. And here's what I think is one of the more important parts in that guidance is sufficient to support your ongoing operations in a manner that is not significantly detrimental to the business. So if you think about it, that took the initial words, it's necessary to have, which implies without it, your business goes under and made it to be it's necessary to keep your business, or at least try to keep your business, relatively in line with where it was before. Kind of a maintenance concept. Now, the important part about that is, this is, you know, we talked about the safe harbor is not really a safe harbor. And this has been one of the areas where the enforcement has happened. Over 2 million, this is certainly one of the areas. And at least in our experience, and I think Rick from our conversations on a couple of these, both in clients and in a transaction that I have right now where we're looking to buy another company, the certification of need is really, this is the basis. This is where if you're audited, you're able to tell Treasury, the feds, if you're publicly listed, the SEC has been sending information requests, which notwithstanding it's called a request is not really something that you can not reply to to document where you did the analysis as the borrower, as the owner of the business, the board of directors, why you needed those funds based on the standard we just talked about. And the importance of that is because if you fail to justify, if you didn't meet the standard, or maybe you did, but you just can't prove it because you don't have sufficient documentation available, you can end up in a position where the smallest least penalty is you may have to repay your loan right away. The much further penalty of the things that Jerry Gleason, my partner, will be talking about a little bit later, which is federal enforcement agencies, including Secret Service, Attorney General, FBI, United States Treasury, Department of Justice, and the SEC can come knocking on your door, as well as, strangely enough, the never understood QUITAM actions where Rick might actually sue you. Does that kind of get where you were trying to go, Eric? Yeah, yeah. So 
what should what should uh, and I know we'll sum this uh, up at the end with some of our you know recommendations as to preparing for one, but specifically regarding the necessity certification, what should companies be be uh, you know putting together or should have been put together to to help justify that that conclusion? Well, we'll say certainly should have, but the failure to have documented your decision-making process isn't as much of a problem as not having had. So we'll assume that the borrowers, all the folks on this call, went through and went through a process and did some examination of their business. And they've documented that. One of the things that we've been very stringent and strident with clients is to make sure that those things are documented by, if you're an LLC, for example, by either of the members. If it's manager managed by the managers, if you're a corporation, it's documented in board minutes with attachments. And some of the things you would have wanted to make sure you consider there is, what is the analysis that you undertook? Um, to circle back to my example of the company we're looking at buying just as an illustration, we asked them for their backup documentation for the PPP loan they took in due diligence. And the response was, what documentation? Obviously, if you're in an audit, if you think about it in the IRS terms, that's not a good response. So what you really would like to have is board minutes or the like, like we just talked about, going through what you thought about right now on your understanding of what the economic conditions were at the beginning of this, when the, the current circumstances started. What were the conditions of your business? Did you have a drop in production? Were you starting to have supply chain issues? were suppliers starting to change terms because they were having their own issues. So things that used to be a 60 day pay, you now have people asking to be paid on delivery. Were you having disruptions for employees having to miss work? Were you having to bring in temporary? Were you having to maybe pay extra hazard pay, these bonuses that you heard about sometimes through the system? How were those rolling through then, as well as how did you think how, to the extent you were able to project even then at the beginning, I'm not sure anybody thought this was going to last six months, but nobody thought it was going to last a week. So you, part of that analysis would have been, where do I think this goes? Additionally, you have there on your the overall uncertainty. How does that fit in with long term? If you had to let some people go or if you think you may have to, will you be able to get those people back? Will they be picked up by someone else? Will you have, have to pay more to compete? So those things as you started projecting through. Um, one of the other big things was, and this is one of those where only the government can write something, where they say in three places, you don't have to have examined and exhausted all liquidity available to you. And yet they say you had to examine your liquidity before you took the loan. So somewhat counterintuitive, but you still would have wanted to spend some time as the board the owners, whoever it may be, looking at what sources of liquidity do you have? What sources of liquidity are available to you? Now, going back to our earlier statement on the basis, remember, this is not, I'm going to go out of business if I don't get the money. So as part of that analysis, you would not want to have, or would at least have wanted to thought through, okay, I only have a million dollar line of credit. If this goes on, I take the line of credit, I draw it all the way down, that helps my business go on for 35 days, then now I am completely out of line of credit, I've used all my available funds, and I don't have a PPP loan, then what do I do? Perfectly legitimate to include as part of your analysis, right? Because you need to consider this as part of the overall available sources for funding your business. And again, I can't hit it enough, part of this was making sure that you've got this documented. And for all of our attendees that are listening, to the extent that you went through a fulsome analysis and you looked at all these things and you have all the records showing, look, you did projections of cash flows, you did projections, for example, if we considered laying people off versus not laying people off versus furloughs versus cuts for two months for people. You did all that analysis, if you didn't gather it all in one place with your loan application and all the things you used for your calculations on your loan amount, now's the time to get that all gathered up and organize because strangely enough human nature is what it is 
if I come as an auditor, and this is essentially I, uh, parallel to when I'm representing buyers on a transaction, auditors, prosecutors, buyers, it doesn't matter. If I ask three questions and your answer to everything is I need to go find it, I naturally assume something is wrong or you don't have it. You do not want, and Ryan will be talking about the audit process a little bit more, you don't want the auditor, whoever it may be, to think that you didn't have this, this information available, ready, thought out, that showed you took a good process in taking a loan. It's kind of, that covers most of it pretty much, Rick. At least, you know, yeah. we could spend the next hour and a half going through very detailed, but that hits the high points of what I think we're gonna to need to make sure people have covered. Yeah, so the big uh, big takeaways are that, that you know, it's not one, it's not one factor, it's a multiple, uh, there are the multiple factors to take into account and it's you know if, if you haven't documented this yet if you haven't uh you know shown or thought out or or i say put in into writing the process that was undertaken in, in making that certification it's certainly not too late to do it now and it's been, uh, very wise to do it um no, but certainly, we'll certainly not too late and Again, it's it's no, the other thing that we, we didn't do is, you know, everything we've talked about here so far was in terms of when you took the loan, right? Your certification is made at the time you took the loan. It's always helpful in any circumstance, we all hear about Monday morning quarterbacking. Well, wouldn't it be nice to be in a position where we can be our own Monday morning quarterback? And here is a position where you as the borrower or the business owner can be that. You have your stack of projections and rather than just leaving it of okay we've we've got what we documented when it happened and when we submit our application keep that process going keep adding to that documentation for during the loan period since you applied what actually happened very helpful when someone comes to audit you and go well okay you projected this but it was only your projections and you can pull out that well yeah but i projected that my business would go down by 8.3% over the four month period. And I was already starting to have supplier issues, so I expected a six day lag and an extra 15 days on payables. And you can pull out documentation that shows your payables actually got stretched to 45, things like that. That helps justify, notwithstanding that it's Monday morning quarterbacking, why not be your own Monday morning quarterback? Sure, so if you were, if you were getting notices uh, from customers that, you know, they're going to slow down orders or cancel orders um, and, and from suppliers that they weren't going to be able to, uh, or they weren't sure whether they were going to be able to continue supplies. I mean, all of that is is relevant, uh, relevant. But but I think you also said something interesting, Jeff, that is good to mind. So, so it's not necessarily the Monday morning quarterback test, but you can also, uh, I would uh, advise to look at what happened what actually happened in your in your specific industry or business i mean obviously if you if you run a restaurant um you know the the, the results are throughout the whole industry uh pretty self evident so so you can you know take take what you uh are able to take from F in, in actuality but again the the test is made at the you know the, the time of applying for the loan so Oh yeah, always nice to be able to say, if you have to, but okay, maybe let's let's assume you didn't do a great job documenting. You didn't do a great job getting all the things we've just discussed. To your point, Rick, it's great to be able to look at an auditor and say, okay, I may not have done a good job, but I was pretty sure this is going to happen. And by the way, here's the trade press, here's the restaurants. This is what's happened to the industry. That's is going to help you a lot to have that ready. So I agree completely. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on to Ryan and and talk about uh, what does what can we what can uh, we expect an audit to look like and and how should a company respond when it gets that notice? Um, you know, and I know Ryan's been through a lot of tax audits with the IRS who uh, uh, who are not. They don't have jurisdiction over this, but uh, I think there's some parallels here that might be useful. So Ryan, maybe explain some of that process. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So yeah, sorry for the technical difficulty. To start there. Um, yeah, so I think there is, you know, Rick, as you said, there are some parallels between, you know, an IRS type audit, but you know, some important distinctions as well. I, I think the but the general principle, obviously, in both is that we want to have adequate records to substantiate the actions taken. Uh, Jeff, I think, appropriately mentioned, you know, one of the one of the key points of, of any PPP loan audit is going to be uh, establishing that the borrower had a need for the money, and that in that. so that's going to be a clear baseline. But in addition to the need, then we've got to have the financial nexus to the dollars that were received under the PPP loan and what was expended. So, uh, you know, as everybody's known, this has sort of been a, an evolving target. Uh, we've had, you know, there was an eight week initial, an eight week period in which the funds had to be spent, or you got your eight week payroll events, and then uh, cer certain funds had to be expended within that period. But at the end of the day, we've got to have a clear nexus of all financial information. So if you received $100,000 of PPP loan, and we can't support that that money was used for eligible expenses such as payroll and rent, uh, that's going to be problematic. So I think uh, the first order of business when you get that is to, say, to the extent you haven't taken uh, the steps that Jeff had previously mentioned in terms of uh, going through and building your case sort of that you have eligibility for the loan and how we're going to implement all these expenditures. We really need to maintain all our state and federal tax records, all our financial statements, uh, and sort of have our tracking of all the funds that are needed. So a lot of borrowers used accountants to, to prepare these uh, these types of forms uh, or their initial PPP loan application. Um, you know, I think the first piece of advice would be call your accountant or CPA, uh, your tax lawyer, whoever you happen to use to put this stuff together. And we, we're, we're looking to build a comprehensive case uh, when we go for this type of analysis. So, you know, as Jeff said, and I think Rick said before, if we have an auditor come in and we say, well, we'll just spend the money on, and the answer is we have no clue, uh, that we're not off to a good start right there. So I think we've got a clearly defined set of parameters that the money could be permissibly used for, obviously predominantly wages. Uh, the, the, the real purpose of the program was to allow companies to essentially borrow money from the government to keep those, to keep their employees employed so to speak, during uh, a period in which employers otherwise wouldn't have done so. Uh, so obviously proving the nexus between the funds that came in and the funds that went out is, is really the critical piece uh, to tie up the financial end of it in addition to the certification that the funds were in fact needed. So when we look at documentation, again, that is going to be requested, I mean, you're really going to have to provide anything that you submitted with the PPP loan application. Uh, any, any of that information is going to have to be submitted on an audit. Uh, they're going to look for state and federal tax returns to prove you know, your quarterly 941s, uh, any sort of state unemployment tax returns that were filed. Uh, so we've got to establish the number, you know, the, mon the money that came in goes to employees. Uh, and, it, you know, there's, if you used it to pay rent or other expenses, obviously some sort of paper trail. So if your business doesn't have, you know, well-defined financials, it might be a good time to put those together uh, before you're audited. Uh, hopefully, you know, we were a little more proactive up front. And if we do, we have audited financials, then I think that certainly audited or reviewed financials would be of great assistance and is going to help make your PPP audit go a bit more smoothly. Uh, but at the end of the day, we've got to prove we spent the money within a certain period of time for qualified purposes and you know, record retention and the typical type of tax records you'd use are really what's what's going to be provided to a PPP auditor as well. Okay. And then, <clears throat> Ryan, also, is there an appeal process? And if so, what, is that, what does that look like? Yeah, so, yeah, and I think you touched on some of these points earlier, Rick. If, if, so, we, so we go through an audit uh, similar to any other type of audit if we have a disagreement between the taxpayer and the, the SBA on whether or not either the audit either the company was initially qualified to receive the funds or whether the funds were spent for appropriate purposes uh, then we do have recourse to challenge that appeal or on appeal so 
there's a there's some recent guidance that's come out that addresses you know the nature of the appeal structure. So whether or not, regardless of the basis of the audit disallowance, you know whether it was you didn't really need the money or you know you took the money and went to Vegas rather than paying your employees, uh, you're you're basically going to have to appeal the decision within the within the uh, within the guidelines. Uh, and, and, the, and the appeal period is a relatively tight time period, so there's admin, some administrative formalities that uh, we've uh, got to be fairly cognizant of. So if you get an adverse determination on a PPP audit, you've got 30 days to appeal uh, appeal the audit or the adverse determination. Uh, the, the appeal itself, uh, there's you know fairly well-defined jurisdictional bases that have to be outlined in each appeal. Uh, so you've got to... Basically, you're, you're appealing it to a what amounts to an administrative law judge. If anybody's ever been in an unemployment tax audit uh, in the state of Michigan, at least, that it's similar to that type of process. So a little different than your typical tax audit where you're going through uh, an appeals and an, an internal appeals uh, type approach. Uh, so it, so you, you basically have to look at within 30 days, you've got to submit a full sort of brief on why, you know, why, why the decision's adverse, you know, what specific facts and law do you, you, know, you disagree with? Uh, and so at this point, if you get a notice for audit, if, you're, if you have an audit, if, if a lawyer's not involved during your audit and you, set, you, you get an adverse determination, you're required to appeal that. And I think it's, uh, that's certainly as good of a time to call your lawyer as any if you haven't already done so. Because uh, this really becomes an adversarial proceeding at that point with high, you know, pretty significant, you know, both economic and potentially criminal risks, depending on the you know, jury. I'll talk about a bit of that, some of that stuff later. Um, but essentially, to appeal it, you're going to have to state your legal case uh, in a, you know, a typical legal type brief, all facts and law supporting your claim. You know, the relief being sought, whether you're objecting to. You know the the forgiveness denial or the you know, d disqualification or any sort of other penalties. You're gonna have to file your payroll tax return. You're gonna have to provide the uh, administrative law judge with your tax returns. Uh, any other sort of federal income tax returns, especially if you were a partnership or sole proprietor, uh, you've got to establish that you had self-employment income that would have warranted uh, this this type of uh, the, the the nature of the PPP loan and the amount. And so that that process generally has to be done within 30 days. Uh, after that, there's going to be a, a sort of an informal hearing. Uh, the administrative law judge is going to have some discretion as to how that hearing is conducted. They may go on the record that you submitted that audit. I think another good point here, maybe take a step back, is oftentimes you know a reason to be even more focused at the time of the audit is that some administrative law judges will only look at the record that was in the administrative file that the uh, SBA had a chance to review. So if you don't get your arguments in the record, you could have some adverse issues trying to make new arguments later. Uh, it's certainly not to say that it won't happen, but I think we put ourselves in a better position on appeal uh, if we get all arguments on the table. Uh, the, the ALJ does have discretion under the, under the, the authority to hear additional or new arguments as to why uh, the determination was wrong, but it's it's best to get the record complete uh, at the audit stage. Uh, and so, once we have the once we go through and get the appeal filed, if there's an adverse determination from the ALJ, then there's further recourse. Uh, you can, can the taxpayer continually has rights to appeal. You can appeal up to a high the SBA administrator, and then to the extent we still have adverse results, we can get action or relief in the federal courts. So. You know, there's a relatively cumbersome process in some ways that resembles, you know, your typical kind of Michigan unemployment tax audit. Uh, but obviously, the, starting with a starting with a good audit usually leads to better results in, in, at both the appeals and, you know, if it were to get that far in the in the court level. So I think the emphasis is on doing the due diligence, getting the documentation in place at the audit, so we have a better chance to uh, have success as we work our way through the administrative law system and the, potentially the federal court system. Okay. And then it occurs to me, it occurs to me that there might be uh, the way a business is treating loan proceeds or forgiveness uh, on its taxes, you know, might, you know, have 
have some impact on this. So let's let me ask you just a few uh, of the issues that are out there on the tax side. So will forgiveness of a PPP loan is that taxable? So yeah, and that's yeah, it's a good question. So generally, the the guidance has come out has said that any sort of forgiveness of PPP loan is non-taxable. Uh, this, of course, is an exception to uh, the general tax principles, which is in it, which say uh, that any sort of forgiveness of indebtedness, you know, subject to some exceptions, it generates taxable income. So uh, when the when Congress put this together, the legislative history is pretty clear. And the statute itself is pretty clear that the loan, at least at the federal level, forgiveness of that loan will not result in taxable income. So that's the good news. I think the the, the more interesting questions are at the state level. Uh, some states follow federal taxable income. Uh, other states have specifically adopted guidance to conform, you know, their systems with PPP requirements. But um, th that's sort of the minority. So I, I think we've got a situation where at the federal level. We're very comfortable assuming that the loan is forgiven properly, uh, that, that that amount won't result in income uh, to the taxpayer at the federal level. But at the state and local level, uh, further consideration of that issue uh, is likely going to be needed with the Reader Tax Advisor. Okay. How, how about the how about the other uh, big issue in, in terms of deductibility of expenses that were paid with PPP loan proceeds? Yeah, I think this, this is another great point, Rick. I think he, so the, the I think the way this was sold to most companies was that you know the government is essentially paying for your payroll. You know, when you get two months of free payroll for the PPP, assuming you know that you meet all the requirements, and if you use the money for qualified purposes, that you're sort of the employer is going to be held harmless. There's not going to be any taxable income on the amounts received, and the government's essentially picking up your payroll. I think the, the, the intent of that is clear from the legislative history and, and most of the rulings that I've read. However, the, the IRS has, has taken, at least the bureaucrats at the IRS have taken, for the time being, a stand that we think is contrary to the legislative intent. Uh, there's a long standing law that says if, you, if a taxpayer you, receives money that's from a non taxable source, like a grant, and then uses that money to pay a deductible expense, uh, that that deduction is essentially disallowed uh, so we've got a situation where if you had payroll or if you had a you know, hundred thousand dollar ppp loan come in you use it to pay your payroll it's not you don't have a hundred thousand dollars of taxable income but at the end of the day the hundred thousand dollars you use to pay your payroll is not deductible on your tax return so that results in a situation where you could have exhausted your cash to pay the employees because it was ppp money and so as a, so as a result of this deduction denial, you essentially end up with taxable income on cash that you were more or less a conduit from. So you got your hundred thousand dollars in the door, it went out the door, you get no cash left over, but you're not getting a deduction for that amount. So let's say that hundred thousand dollars would have offset your taxable income and resulted in zero tax liability. Now you've got a hundred thousand dollars of taxable income and you know let's call it thirty thousand dollars of potential tax liability. So I think that was a surprise to many. Uh, and, and maybe maybe some on this call is just hearing this for the first time, but uh, that, that's a significant concern. A lot of people took this money in good faith, and uh, you know, are a bit uh, feel a bit uh, like they've been treated unfairly as a result of them keeping employees on the payroll, especially restaurants, for example, that they would have cut and then incurred no expense for. And now they're incurring potential tax liability if that, this IRS rule is upheld. Uh, there is some. I think some movement toward uh, pushing Congress to clarify that and kind of overrule the IRS interpretation. If we get a stimulus four bill through, you know, obviously that's still highly political at this point, but uh, that issue may be addressed. But, uh, but for the time being, there's still, I think, some material tax consequences associated with that lack of de deductibility issue. Okay. Yeah, that sounds, uh, sounds uh, pretty important to keep in mind. Um, well, thanks, Ryan. We'll, if we have time later, we'll revisit a couple other issues. But I want to turn over to Jerry now, and uh, and this was the up to now sort of the soft part of the presentation, and you know we get into the the heavy duty stuff with Jerry. So Jerry, um, maybe just uh, give our give our audience an overview of uh, 
what are the potential what's the potential liability that they might have for um you know making improper certifications and what's explain the false claims act claims and who files under those claims and and again the exposure sure and this is moving outside of the administrative realm with administrative procedures directly to federal court um, there are criminal ramifications there are civil ramifications uh, looking at the, at the civil aspect and how the government might pursue um, people who might not have certified their applications correctly the one that jumps out is the False Claims Act this is a, a, a law that goes back to the Civil War um, it's primarily associated with government contracting back in the Civil War there were blankets and horses and how healthy those horses were and whether those blankets uh, how many of them were being shipped um, and what we see oftentimes now is uh, whether the particular piece of equipment was made in America, whether it's up to a certain standard, uh, and the government can pursue individuals and companies for false submissions where money from the federal government is being requested. The False Claims Act punishes or creates liability for the submission of false claims for payment from the federal government and that would qualify and cover the uh, loan applications that are making their way through SBA to the, to the uh, monies that are being sent out by the banks. Um, the, the, the real kickers here are the penalties. Um, it's up to $10,000 per claim, and sometimes the claim can be the particular box on an application as opposed to the application as a whole. And most importantly, it can be up to treble damages. And so to the extent you get a a million dollar loan that's trouble three million dollars and, and more that penalties could accrue if you're found liable additionally you're also responsible for paying the government's cost of litigation or in the context of a private party as well the attorney fees of a private party um, where the false claims act has a, a particular incentive uh, for lawsuits is that it can be brought in a number of different ways uh, primarily three First, by the federal government itself, a, an assistant U.S. attorney from one of the offices of U.S. attorney in the, the 50 states um, brings the lawsuit itself or contacts you and says you're under investigation. Uh, the next most frequent is one brought by a private party. We call this is the key TAM uh, lawsuit that was uh, identified earlier. The plaintiff is known as a relator. And oftentimes the relator is a disgruntled employee or former employee who files the lawsuit uh, in hopes of getting up to 30% of the recovery because the act incentivizes these types of lawsuits by giving a private party a reward, so to speak, if the lawsuit is successful. And the way these lawsuits start is that a private party files it. It's kept under seal at the district court where it is filed so the public can't see it. And then it's turned over to the federal government to determine whether or not the government will take it over. Um, the real incentive here for lawyers and private parties is they file the lawsuit, the government takes it over, and for a fairly low investment in filing the suit, they get a potential 30% recovery of whatever the government gets on the back end. Um, these cases tend to be fairly complex, um, fairly document intensive. Uh, there are a number, having handled them myself, um, they can emanate from various locations. Uh, we had a case with clients here that was brought in Philadelphia and required us to fly back and forth to Philadelphia to deal with the U.S. Attorney's Office there and litigate. Um, but the real concern for me in this area is the disgruntled employee, the laid off employee who decides either to file the lawsuit or contact someone at the federal government to say, you ought to look at this particular company. And as Jeff indicated earlier, we don't like to think about Monday morning quarterbacking, uh, but when we look at the claim itself, it's either the application potentially for the loan or certifications regarding forgiveness. Um, and certainly uh, th those certifications at the time may have been made in good faith, um, but the government doesn't always see it that way, uh, depending on what they're looking at um, in the rearview mirror. So it is something to be substantially concerned about. Uh, additionally, there are criminal ramifications. On uh, September 10th, the Department of Justice announced 57 individuals being charged with various fraud counts related to PPP loans. Um, I looked at some of these indictments and complaints. Candidly, they are kind of the low-hanging fruit, if you will. They are the fake companies, the fake employees, um, 
you know, fake bank accounts and all sorts of things. Uh, and on the back end, the money's not spent on any business. It's on boats and cars and, and in one case, a strip club. So th th those are fairly easy for the government to identify as uh, criminally fraudulent activities because there's really nothing legitimate associated with them. They are started as fraud, they are paid, and, and the money goes out for fraudulent activities. And we've had at least one filed here in the Eastern District of Michigan. The types of crimes you'll see are wire fraud, bank fraud, money laundering. Those are your, your typical white collar type uh, fraud charges. Um, I, I note that these cases are the easy ones for the government to find when you're looking for fake companies and things like that. Um, as the uh, time progresses and government gets back to work, I suspect that they're going to take advantage of the technology they use in Medicare fraud, um, which uses sophisticated algorithms to hunt down submissions and, and physicians, uh, care providers, uh, based on the type of financials that are being submitted to the government to, to root out fraud. Um, importantly, the government has plenty of time to do that because bank fraud has a particularly long statute of limitations of 10 years, so that uh, they're going to have some time to dig in. And I suspect you'll see FBI, IRS, uh, the OIG folks from various uh, uh, federal departments looking for opportunities to prosecute these crimes. This is this, at some point will be a, as mortgage fraud was, as Medicare fraud is now, will be kind of a common. Uh, aspect because of the amount of money that was dispersed so far. Um, the guidelines, because there are sentencing guidelines for crimes like this, I ran them on a $1.5 million loan. Um, assuming bad things happen, you're looking at upwards of 75, 80, 90 or more months in federal prison if you are convicted of that type of offense at that dollar number. So certainly the penalty is serious. How are you knowing? Are you going to know when you're under investigation criminally? Well, You'll either get a grand jury subpoena at some point in time, uh, you'll get a search warrant executed where they come basically and just take your stuff, uh, or agent friendly comes knocking on your door and says, I want to talk to you. Um, you will not know if they are looking at your bank records. They will, you will not know if they're looking at your business tax records. The only time is when the grand jury or a real full-on investigation is already rolling and they are coming to seek the information directly from, from you. I will note that not a lot of this is going on right now here in the Eastern District of Michigan. The courthouse is closed. The grand jury meets, I think, once or twice a week, and the U.S. Attorney's Office in our district is focusing, I think, on public safety risks of an immediate nature and cases where the statute of limitations is coming due and they are have to file it or risk being uh, time barred. But I think at some point in time, given the, the gravity here, we're going to continue to see uh, more and more investigation from the uh, the criminal aspect uh, just because of the opportunities here and, and the ability that the federal government has to dig in and, and look and see and compare applications versus financial conditions of companies. Oh, real quick one, Jerry. The, the current guidance, the guidance that's out there and at least the current requirements by the SBA is that you maintain all the documentation related to your loan, which would go from inception, your necessity certificate, and your application for forgiveness, they're saying six years. But if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying the bank fraud, which would be notwithstanding that the application was technically federal, you actually were getting your money in a loan from a bank. So now you've committed bank fraud by a false statement. Now you're under the bank fraud. That's got a 10 year statute of limitations. So shouldn't we be, notwithstanding the SBA guidance, shouldn't our clients, the people on this call, be maintaining those records for that 10 year period? I'm in complete agreement. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, um, Marnita says that we've uh, hit our time <laughs> limit and we need to open it up for questions now, but let me, uh, um, <clears throat> while people can can type in their questions, so let me just maybe, maybe summarize by highlighting what's been said. I mean, it's important to just, uh, at a very high level is to if you haven't done so you know put your put your documentation together and document um your your analysis your your decision making process of necessity but as well start putting together um you know the 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 evidentiary documentation for the various aspects expenditures 
uh, calculations that you're making under that you've made under the loan and you've lo used the loan proceeds. And um, you want to be prepared for this. So, do we have any questions? To answer. No, I'm not seeing any questions so far. So let me let me just uh, in the meantime just ask a couple quick ones. One uh, to follow up with Jerry. So as with uh, most criminal statutes, um, it, it requires some kind of intent, knowing action to do this. Is that true still under the False Claims Act, where it's uh, brought by a private individual? Uh, can't hear you, Jerry. I always forget that mute button on these Zoom conferences. Um, yes, the the uh, False Claims Act requires a knowingly uh, intent, so you knowingly submit that. Um, it has a common sense uh, definition to it, but by the same token, it, it also includes deliberate indifference or reckless disregard of the truth. So you can't turn a blind eye or or, or somehow and I do one of these, you have to, to, to really pay attention that things are being submitted in a proper way. So knowing means not only knowing, but probably should have known had you paid any attention. Is that probably about right? Yeah, the, 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 and remember when you're, you're dealing with these cases, they're going to be brought sometime down the road. Um, so the government is going to exercise the, um, the ability to say woulda, coulda, shoulda in a much more um, broad way because they're going to look at your business after the fact, not as you were looking at it at the time you were submitting the loan. And it's going to be incumbent upon the private party to tell the government, look, this is why you're wrong. Um, in, in, in focus, again, as we've mentioned on the, the, the aspect and the record keeping at the time these certifications are being made. Okay, thanks. I see a question in the box. Uh, it says, have they affirmatively decided the duration issue? And can you use any duration between eight weeks and the 24 weeks? And that came from, look like it says date. Yeah, the, the guidance is relatively clear. It is, but if you want to say, affirmatively decided for that period, the usage period, and there's a bunch of different ones as everybody who started looking at this, it is eight weeks or 24 weeks. You, you, you can't really pick 12, although I guess in theory you could, because you can apply for forgiveness before the expiration if you chose the 24 week period. You can put in a forgiveness application prior to the expiration of the total 24 week period, but so doing obviously has influence on your ability to have been able to cure problems that you may otherwise have been able to cure under one of the applicable safe harbors with respect to, for example, FBEs and those types of things. Once you submit your application, you're done. So it's eight weeks or 24 weeks subject to your willingness to be brave enough to submit that forgiveness application early. Okay. And then this question is from Linda, and she is asking, is the PPP deductible when the business is 100% owned by the shareholders? I tossed that to Ryan, but I, I, I'm not sure what I yeah, I'm not, uh, can you Can you repeat that question? I want to make sure I, I didn't hear. Okay. So you said when the business is 100 yeah, is the PPP deductible when the uh, business is 100% owned by the shareholders? I'm not completely sure where we're going, where we're going with that, but in a, you know, let's say you've got a sole proprietorship where you, know, you, you took a $100,000 loan 
uh, prorated up for the two months. So you got roughly $20,000 and then you, that's your sort of self-employment income. Uh, that itself, since you're not paying an employee, that wouldn't generate a deduction. Uh, but again, it's not included in income. Uh, in the situation where you've got maybe a wholly owned S corporation, let's say, or C corporation, and you were to pay, you know, got the PPP loan with the company, and then you pay the money to employ for employees for salary purposes, I think the same issue that we discussed would apply. Uh, because the, the, assuming the, the PPP loan is forgiven, you get tax-free money. The IRS, under current, under the IRS current view, uh, that forgiveness would not be taxable, but the expenditure of the funds would not result in a deduction. So that would give you energy, income at the corporate level. So I think the answer is a little bit different depending on whether we've got a sole proprietor uh, or we've got a separate corporation that's wholly owned. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, and, and Ryan, to follow up on that, there was another question about, that's on the federal level. Are you familiar with uh, what the Michigan view on those issues is? Are? I think Michigan has made an attempt to conform. I, I, I believe Michigan has made an attempt to conform uh, at least the COD rule. Uh, so I, I don't think the exposure is as significant in Michigan, uh, but I think other states are, are, are have not taken those steps. So, yeah, I think there's there's certainly arguments to be made, and obviously, you know, to the extent these, I mean, a lot of taxpayers are going to, even if the IRS doesn't change the rule, they're going to contest it and file returns and say, you know, this was the deal, and the, the, your whatever rulemaking you the IRS has come out with is, you know, it really is inconsistent with the legislative intent that the business owners be held harmless uh, and essentially act as a conduit. So. Uh, merely because the IRS has come out and said it's not deductible isn't going to prevent a taxpayer from taking the position that it is deductible on a return. Uh, but this will be fought out in a tax audit rather than a PPP audit. And then maybe if we have time for one more, uh, Marnita, because another question just came in about the due dates. Um, Jeff, I, you might know this. So uh, that there's some confusion out there of when the forgiveness application is due, 10 months from the end of your uh, selected period, but some banks apparently are saying it's due by December 31 and some by October 31. Yeah. Do you have any, any? Uh... I have no idea where October 31 is coming from. Um, the other one is a result of, again, the way the verbiage is written. And it is essentially the 10 months or December 31, based on current guidance, would be, appears to be correct. It's no later than 10 months after the date your loan was funded. You can find that date on your promissory note or December 31. Now, I have no problem admitting the guidance right now is not crystal clear. So that's like a 97% kind of an answer because that's about as good as it gets. As far as the October date, I've seen nothing that ties out to that. The current rules are no later than 10 months or December 31, 2020, which part of the confusion comes up, right? Because some people, if you got, if you received your PPP loan later, you could have ended up with 24 weeks running from a PPP application you didn't get until August and the dates just don't work real well. Um, and for those people, we're also waiting on a little bit of guidance from the SBA, because in that circumstance, the dates just don't work. You are you can't have a measurement period that runs past December 31 and be required to put in your forgiveness application by December 31. Okay. And then if we have time for one more, a quick one, uh, the... And this will be the last one. Marty. The uh, question came in about the eight or 24 week rule. Can uh, a borrower select something in between, let's say a 10 week period, sometime within that 24 week period? Yeah, that's essentially the one we touched on earlier. The periods as stated in the applicable rules are eight weeks or 24 weeks. That's it. The only way you can change that and arguably get to that 
10 week kind of result would be to submit your forgiveness application at that time. And that's gonna stop all your measurements, that's gonna stop any ability to cure, any ability to use a safe harbor for curing FTE headcounts, things like that. Once you submit that forgiveness application, you're done. So you can get to that result, notwithstanding it is not actually one of the allowable measurement periods, but you do so at your own peril. You're giving up time to maybe cure something. And part of that, while we're on it, just so we're, so a number of people may on the call may have remembered, initially your ability to kind of cure some of these FTE headcount items and things, that only ran to June. And so that negated this issue. But that's been extended now through December 31. So if you have anything that could influence your, that you may be able to have an influence affirmatively to cure FTE reductions, headcount reductions, things like that, that you have the ability to cure. Based on what we know now, there's not a whole lot of reason to submit your forgiveness application before you have to and give up the ability to cure that deficit and cure that reduction in your potential forgiveness. Okay. Okay. All right, well, I just thank each of you so much. This was very uh, valuable information. Um, to all the participants, we thank you for uh, staying on the line and getting this information. You'll receive an email from me later on today with today's discussion. It'll be a link that you can click on. So all of this valuable information, the miller Canfield team just uh, share with you, it's on tape, so you can go back and listen and see uh, if you missed something or if you have a question. And then uh, as you guys have more questions coming in, I will be sure to share with the team. And then uh, Miller Canfield could uh, arrange with uh, any answers that uh, they may have from this presentation that they provided. Also ask you to visit our website to uh, at www.detroitchamber.com slash COVID. On there, you can get all the information on our research seminars, as well as our MPC 20 conversations that are going through uh, November. We're uh, very uh, glad to have you again, Team Miller Canfield and all your knowledge. Thank you very much. And we just hope everybody stays safe and healthy. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you.